right after I finished Wine Dark Sea, I was in Austin for the final rehearsals of that. And I was in the car with Jerry Junkin, who was doing the premiere. And he said, you know, you do this. And he like said what the intervals were. He's like, you know, you do that in like every piece. Like, and I you know, put my fingers on my ears like, la, 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 la. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I really appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now on to my next guest, John Mackey. Hi, John. Hello. John, thank you for joining the show today. Yes, thanks for asking. You are guest number 100. Woo! Woo. <laughs> this is something, you know, when I first started this, I did one and I thought, well, we'll see how this goes. And then I did all the editing and I thought, well, I don't know if I'm going to make it to five. And then I thought, well, I'll go to. How do you find the, how do you find the time? You have like a job too. And other things that you do. So. I do. I, I, I am blessed with a, a wife who gives me lots of time and um, understands the things that I, I need to do in my, you know, for myself. And so I just kind of shoehorn it in between teaching and composing. You know, I, I, I make a couple of hours a week for this and, and those are for this show and that's it. Well, we thank you. I feel like I should be interviewing you, honestly. I think we should just like <laughs> go through your, your favorites of the past 99. And uh, this is great. Well, you know, I, I did one conference presentation in New York. I'm going to try to get some more done where I talk about sort of the guests and what people there's a there's a collected wisdom and there's sort of things that come out that are that are trends throughout the hundred episodes that have have sort of manifested themselves. So oh, that'd be really interesting to hear. Yeah. 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 It's a, a lot of work to kind of d- distill all that, but I've done a little bit of it. So well, let's get to you. So, John, I don't know if you need to, but can you introduce yourself for the listeners? Uh, sure. I'm John Mackey. I'm a composer. Um, I write mostly for band. I do other things also. I didn't write my first band piece until about 15 years ago. And uh, But since I started doing that, that's been the majority of what I do. Um, there's maybe a piece, a chamber ensemble piece or a vocal piece or a choral piece or something that I'll do like once a year. That's just a completely different thing. But the majority of my work is for band now. This is really interesting to me, John, because I am, we're about of the, about the same age and I had a very different sort of path. I got my doctorate, um, in composition and mm-hmm. I was writing mostly avant-garde music. And I've said this on the show before chamber music, but I didn't feel like I was being very honest to myself. And I actually stopped writing for six years. Wow. And then one day I decided I was going to write band music again. And I just sort of caught the bug again. It's like, I have to write, I have to write, I have to write. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things early on when I sort of got writing again is I, you know, I discovered your music and Steve's music, Steve Bryant's music, and I read your article about band versus orchestra, uh-huh. which is, of course, tongue in cheek. But I, I think that's such an important thing that you wrote. Uh, well, I, I well, actually I got some complaint uh, tweets about it a couple months ago. It's interesting. I hadn't read it for a long time. I wrote it. What? you know, 12 years ago or 13 years mm-hmm. ago or something when I was pretty you know, new into the, the band world. And the contrast between working with orchestras and working with bands was really intense. And, you know, I, I love both, but they're completely different. And so I wrote this thing kind of, you know, making, you know, this representation of two different types of people, one named band and one named orchestra. Um, but when I read it now, it actually reads a little bit like, oh, I wouldn't write it like that anymore. Yeah, now yeah. it sounds a little bit like, oh, that's kind of clueless about, you know, me too and other things. Like at the time it was very funny. Now I'm like, oh no, no, no. But the idea of it, you know, stays. The idea being that there's this thing that in the blog post, you know, I said, you're like, you're married to this 
this person named Orchestra, who is just stunningly beautiful and everybody loves this person, but this person just does not care about you at all um, as a composer. And, you know, you go to parties and things and, you know, you're with the, your, your mate, you know, Orchestra, and everybody only wants to like, like all, all your mate wants to talk about is dead people, like is not interested at all in talking about like you or what your work is. And one day you go to a party and there's this other person that like the, you know, waiting for a glass of wine or whatever. And they're like, what do you do? And you're like, oh, I'm a composer. And that person that you're talking to, that person name is Bam. And that person, when they're like, they hear, oh, I'm a composer, they lose it. They get so excited that they're meeting a composer. And this is like the coolest thing that ever happened. And this person is like super loud and boisterous and like totally like, you're just like so excited that someone cares at all about what you do. And that kind of sort of is a little mini version of what I had written because that had been my experience. Um, you know, I had a, around this, I, my first band piece was a piece called Redline Tango, which in, originally, well, first it was a chamber ensemble piece that I wrote for a dance company. Then I did an orchestra version of it. Um, and then the band version. And it's been, it was just, so I could literally see night and day between my first band piece and my professional orchestra piece and how they were received and uh, what my experience was with ensembles. And it could not have been more different. Um, right. And I could talk about specifics of like literally things that happened with those two pieces and traveling to work with ensembles on those pieces. But, you know, I don't necessarily need to like trash talk my experience with orchestras. It's just very, very different world. And, you know, the players get so much more excited uh, in bands than they ever did in any orchestras. And um, I mean, it was a little different when I worked with like youth orchestras, obviously, then it's a little bit more of a similar dynamic to what it is in bands, but still you are the one general like thrown on, or, you know, you're the afterthought programming piece if you're on an orchestra concert and you're alive. Yeah. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry. No, I mean, I, I even had that literally happen once. I had a performance with an orchestra and the conductor, you know, came out to talk to the audience and said, you know, uh, they were doing two, my piece and then two Rachmaninoff pieces. And uh, he said, before we get to the featured composer of the evening, we're going to bring up the composer of this first piece who wrote Red Line Tango. And he's going to tell you about that. And I came out and I said, I'm sorry. I just heard for the first time that I'm not the featured composer on this program. The other one's dead. <laughs> so the you know, audience thought was funny, but also a little uncomfortable laughter. <laughs> so like, it was just, but that, that happened basically every time. And that is so the opposite of what happens with fans. Yeah. You know, the orchestra world, we're competing with uh, composers who are, that, that canon is much bigger and of course they're all dead for the most part yeah and so when i when you know we bring up that article i know we have i mean there's some problematic things you you mentioned <laughs> but but the, the the tenor of it is what's important is the idea that the band world is is very accepting of composition and you as someone who came from a very serious place juilliard and and <laughs> well no it is a serious place you know it's no it is it is yeah and and to come into the band world and do what you've done, I think I think that's why something that's really important. Um, I mean, it was something that I honestly uh, resisted. Um, I I tell the story a lot. Uh, so you know, the studio that I was in at Juilliard, we, I studied with John Corleano, who is an incredible composer and teacher. And it's a very small studio. Uh, there are between three and four students in there at a time, and. When I was there, uh, in one year, the four of us who were in the studio were you know, me and Steve Bryant and Jonathan Newman and Eric Whitaker. And that was the whole studio. So we all got to be you know, very close. And you know, even then, Eric was writing band music. And I remember him playing as Ghost Train because he had just finished that. And I thought, well, that's really cool. I didn't know bands could do that, but I'm not gonna do a band piece. And he kept telling the other three of us, you guys should be writing band music. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm going to keep writing this orchestra music that, you know, gets like three performances and that makes it a hit. That's all you can ever, that's a lot. Um, or I'll write, primarily what I was writing was chamber music for dance companies um, and just local choreographers and things in New York City. And I loved that work, but you can't live on that work at all. Um, so especially living in New York City, it was just not possible. Um, so anyway, he kept saying, you know, you should write a band piece. And, you know, your music is, you know, accessible and rhythmic and it would really fit great. And I kept thinking, no, 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 I, I don't, I don't need band music, Eric Whitaker. And that was just so arrogant of me and out of touch and honestly snobby, really. And uh, I had, I based that on nothing. 
um, other than just, I didn't really know what band could do because I had never been in band. I never played an instrument. So I was never in band. My undergrad had no wind ensemble. Juilliard had no wind ensemble. So I just never heard collegiate level or professional level band music. Um, so as far as I knew, it was all in B flat and four, four. And, you know, that was, I'm like, oh, that's not what I do. So, um, eventually I, I guess I tell a story. It's I, I was composer in residence with a youth orchestra in Minneapolis one year and they were playing a new piece and an early orchestra piece. And by coincidence, the national CBDNA convention, college band director, national association, the national convention was happening that same year in Minneapolis, the weekend before when I had to be there anyway, to work with the youth orchestra. So I decided to finally take Eric's advice and at least go see what serious band literature was like, like what was really happening over the course of eight concerts by the top college groups in the country in one weekend. So I flew out early and went to the convention and heard a ton of great, great stuff. Um, and uh, including like the premiere of the Bob Reynolds transcription of the uh, uh, Omani Mysterium premiered there. Um, I heard just incredible concerts and gave out a bunch of CDs that had my orchestra music on it. And um, the next, less than a week later, I got a call from uh, one of the directors who I'd given CD to and asked me to make a band version of Red Line Tango, um, which had just premiered for orchestra that about a month before I think. Uh, so it was a brand new piece for orchestra at the time. And I pushed back on that. I thought there, I had other pieces on the CD that would have worked much better as band pieces, because again, I didn't know what was possible for the medium. And I thought, oh, they, you know, bands can't play in seven, eight, five, eight, and then four, four, and then, you know, five, 16. And, you know, I thought there's no, again, I'm just being, I was being ignorant and snobby. And, um, and he said, no, I, they, they can do this. Um, and uh, the middle of the original version was a violin solo for the concert master. And I was like, we don't, you don't have a violinist, you know, sounding just dumb and snobby again. And uh, I was like, so I don't know how you do that. And he said, it's a soprano saxophone solo. And, uh, and it, it's the, it was a great idea. I never would have thought on my own to make the middle solo of Redline Tango uh, soprano saxophone. So like bottom register, it's all like in the bottom fifth of the instrument, which is a crazy sound on soprano sax. And uh, that's what he suggested, um, uh, Scott Stewart. Is his name. And um, I agreed to it and did the commission. And it turned out he was a saxophone player. So that was why he suggested that. Like if he had been, you know, he'd been, a, I don't know, if he played anything else, it could have been a completely different piece. But I was glad that he used his own bias for his own instrument to be like, oh, no, my instrument plays that. And uh, it was like a really, really smart idea that was totally his doing. And, uh, and then the piece just kind of blew up. I have never had that happen with any of my orchestra music or chamber music or anything. I was just thinking about that attitude. You know, I had that same attitude when I was in graduate school towards band. I always thought, oh, if this doesn't work out as a composer, I'll write band music. <laughs> really? And wow. Little, little did I know that it was going to be the band music, the band medium that was going to save me as a composer later. It's, isn't that right. funny how that works? It totally is. Yeah, like I, it's, like I am now this, you know, I will talk to any young composer about why they should be writing band music or possibly choral music and, you know, things that I would never have, you know, believed when I was in grad school or undergrad. And now I'm like, oh no, y'all are dumb if you don't believe this. And it's, it seems more and more and more common when I do talk to young composers, they, they know that this is how you make a living now and not just make a living, you know, it's fun. And the performances are great and you travel and meet all kinds of players and, you know, different you know, ages and ability levels. And it's, I mean, it's a really incredible career to be able to do. And I'm so grateful that I get to do it and that I just happened to be in a studio with Eric Whitaker when he kept pushing. And eventually I said, yeah, you know, I think that was, I'm, I will always be grateful to him for that. So, you know, John, one of the things that I wrote down in my notes is that I think we should talk about what you mentioned earlier, that you never were in band. Because I know yeah. when you go back through your, your, your blog post from years back, uh, that you talk about how computer music was so important for you. And you have that, yeah. the post that I love, your fa my favorite blog post of yours is the one where you talk about being a, a middle schooler, working with Sid Music and those programs. Because uh -huh. yeah. I yeah. think I had that on the Commodore 64 as well. Amazing. <laughs> 
I didn't ever use it though. I was not as motivated as you. <laughs> so can you tell me about that, how you got your musical start and how you ended up being a composer? Yeah. Um, it's sort of a long ish story. Um, the, it, so everyone's always like, why didn't you play an instrument? Um, and so my parents, uh, were musicians, were amateur musicians, and uh, they played in community band, and my mom played in community orchestras, and um, eventually sang in church choirs. And my dad played saxophone, and he played trumpet in one of the West Coast Navy bands in the 60s. Um, and my mom played flute. My grandfather owned a music store in Ohio, where I'm from. So he owned a music store, did instrument repair, played oboe, clarinet, and flute. So it was like a very musical family. And um, the way I believe the story goes is that um, I, I have an older sister who's a little over eight years older than I am. And when she was really little, my parents thought it would be really just kind of adorable to make a little musician out of her. And um, you know, so I'd like take her to the piano and try to get her to play the piano, but she would hate it and you know, cry and run away. And um, when I came along, you know, eight years later, and then you know, got to be three or four, uh, I would go to the piano that we had and I would try to play the piano but it didn't sound like the records that we had of like Chopin etudes and things. So I would cry being like, oh, that's not what I hear on the record. And then they thought, oh no, it's happening again. Let's just keep him away from the piano. We're going to break him too and make him also not, you know, love music. Like my sister to this day, you know, she listens to music all the time, but never had any interest at all in being a musician. Um, so there was not really, they weren't pushing. And I think we're actually trying to prevent me from, resisting it so they would just kind of like keep me away from the instrument um when i was four my parents got divorced and i lived with just my mother um in like some very small towns in uh ohio and she was only high school educated and you know it was a single mother and we were very very poor like you know welfare food stamps poor and um what that meant, among other things, is that we didn't live in areas that had good schools, so there was not access to instruments anyway. Um, but one thing it did mean is that, again, the benefit of her being so poor is that she continued playing in community orchestras and singing church choirs, and she couldn't afford babysitters. So every Thursday, we would go to some church choir rehearsal, um, and she sang in all kinds. She she was always looking for some religion that she would like. So she tried all kinds of different ones, which meant we got exposed to all kinds of different music and she couldn't afford a babysitter. So there I was every Thursday in choir rehearsal. And then uh, I don't remember what day of the week it was that she had community orchestra rehearsal and again, couldn't afford a babysitter. So she would take me to sit in the back of some high school auditorium in some small town while the orchestra would rehearse whatever for a couple hours. And then, you know, we'd go to the concert whenever that would happen. So I was around it all the time. And, um, you know, my, my dad says I was sort of being like brainwashed to it. <laughs> you know, and she was playing at home all the time. She played, again, flute. So she'd be practicing parts and listening to classical music all the time. So I was always around it. Um, but there just wasn't really access to instruments. So um, when I was, I guess, 11, my grandfather had gotten an Apple IIe in the early 80s. And... Um, he, one day when we were visiting him, he said, do you want me to show you how to write music? And I thought, sure, that sounds fun. And so he you know, took me to his computer and he had this music program called Music Instruction Set. And uh, he said, the only real rule in writing music is you have to have the right number of beats in a measure. So here's what a 4-4 measure means. It means there are four beats and here's how you make a combination of this that adds up to four. Or if you're in three, four, it has to add up to three beats. And that's really it. So if you just follow those rules, have the right number of notes of the measure, you know how to write music now. I love and, that one rule. <laughs> yeah, that's really it. <laughs> Isn't that and great, I'm, though? It opens up everything else. It does. Anything becomes possible. I, that's why I'm especially horrified when I find out from someone that I'll make a mistake in a part and there's like a 16th missing or something. Like, oh, that was the original rule. And I broke the one, the only rule. Um so yes, I, a uh, few months after that, my father got me a Commodore 64 and I got the same music program and just started some, I wrote some of my own music, but mostly what I did is my mother by that time had gotten a job at Ohio State University and I would use her staff ID and I would go to the music library and I would check out standard repertoire that we, I had heard records of at home. Um, 
And I would take that home and I would sequence it using a joystick. And so I put in tons and tons of Bach um, because Bach sounds good no matter what plays it. And it doesn't have to have a ton of rubato generally. So like, you know, fugues and things sound great. Um, so I put in all, most of the well-tempered clavier. I put in all six of the Bach Granville concertos. Wow. I put in a bunch of Vivaldi concertos. Um, and then I started, I put in like the last movement of the Borja Cello concerto. I put in the entire pictures at an exhibition. Um, Holy cow. I, yeah. So this is like how I was spending literally thousands of hours that I was in front of my computer with basically, you know, not a ton of friends, <laughs> apparently, but um, I would just like sequence this music. And initially the ratio of how much I was sequencing versus, versus how much I was writing that was new, you know, it's probably like 5% new music and 95% just other people's music. And then I would try to write something that sounded kind of like something I had just sequenced. So I wrote a lot of really bad fugues, not knowing how to write how Bach wrote, it was, I was just trying to reverse engineer it because I didn't have access to theory books where someone had already reverse engineered it. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to learn it just by like, you know, sequencing it and then trying to make my own version. Um, then eventually got more and more. Uh, my mom eventually was in a Unitarian church choir, which meant they could do really any kind of music that they considered religious at all. And they did the Bernstein Chichester Psalms. And I think I was 13. And so she had the vocal score of the Chichester Psalms, and I sequenced that whole thing. And that was the first time I was exposed to music in seven and 10 and just loaded the tritones. And it totally like, it was like mind blowing to really study that music and sequence every note of that into you know, a Commodore 64. I actually used two Commodore 64s. I eventually got a second one because the computer could only play three notes at a time. Uh, so I got a second one. I plugged each one into a different stereo channel on my little amplifier and I'd start them at the same time. And so I get six notes at a time. Um, and that's like how I spent my, basically all of my free time until high school when I eventually discovered other stuff to do. <laughs> but that was really, you know, like so many hours went into that. And so I know that music really, really intimately, um, you know, every note of it. Cause you know, and I know one way composers used to learn to, you know, learn how to write was to hand copy other composers music so i was essentially doing that i was just doing it with a joystick not a pencil yeah absolutely I, yeah, that's such a tried and true method you know when i was your age i was playing bard's tale and not entering notes in a music oh, that's a great set. game oh, oh fantastic game. Tale, that's great yeah they just released a remake of it i don't know if you saw that no yes i did not <laughs> Yeah, the same game, but modernized with like... Oh, no, yeah. that's terrible. I'm never going to... Now I'm never going to write again. So, John, um, you know, we, I brought this story up because I read it on your blog. And one of the things that impresses me the most about your career and how you've sort of created a, a great career is that you're really active on social media and you had this blog in the early days. Can you talk about that and sort of how you approach your online presence? Huh, that's a good question. Um so the blog, I kind of, I missed the blog. It was very time consuming. You know, there are hundreds of entries on there going, spanning, I don't know, a decade or I don't even know when the first post was. The problem was, you know, once Facebook became a real thing, you know, it's much easier to just essentially micro blog, you know, Twitter or whatever, write, you know, five sentences and reach many more people more quickly and just much more easily than the amount of time that goes into like a proper blog post. Um, so I was doing primarily the blogging was before, you know, I was on MySpace, but no one used that. It sounded seemed like. And then once I was on Facebook, that just kind of took over. Um, so yeah, I probably haven't written a blog post in two years or something, I'm guessing. Um, so there's still a lot of stuff on there that I still refer people to, like about self-publishing and how I decided to do that. And um, you know, there's some pretty pictures of things from back when I used to take a lot of pictures and stuff. Um so I updated that a lot and uh, primarily because if I, the, as long as there was normal content and people would go to the blog, then when there was stuff to write about a new piece, I could use it to promote the new pieces also. Um, and that worked well, you know, like if, but that meant there had to be regular uh, content and there couldn't just be content about a new piece because that would be just really boring. Um, that's always been like something I, I work really hard on on social media now on Facebook and Twitter is to try to make sure that the amount of stuff that's just about music is pretty small. Um, because I want it to be, you know, like that's 
what I put up there is you know my voice. That's what I sound like when I you know talk to groups and stuff. And it's like that's my sense of humor or lack of or whatever. And the stuff that I think is interesting. And I think that's the stuff that's fun to follow, sort of. So that then when there's a post, it's like, oh, I have a new piece. Then it's not like every post is, oh, I have a new piece, or every post is, look at this fancy person that I, you know, that conducted my piece or whatever. Those are big turnoff posts to me. Like I, the you know, humble brag posts. I you have to be so careful with those. And yeah, uh, they're hard to do too. They're yeah, um, and there's like there's an art to doing those. I think like you want to talk about like if you're a composer and something amazing happens, you want to tell people. Um, and like you're proud of what you've done and, you know, maybe they take the piece more seriously because this particular conductor did it at, you know, with this all state group or whatever, but there's a way to do it that makes it not about you, uh, but makes it more about, you know, the students or whatever. And those are, there's a real art to that, that I don't always get right, but it's something I try to do. Um, and, uh, I think in general composers are getting better at it, but I still see like composers I know uh, who you just don't seem to be quite as comfortable about the, the name dropping stuff. Don't do it as well. Um, you know, like it, 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 it just the point that it becomes a real turnoff to read. I generally only do it well when I really know someone well, mm, uh huh. That makes sense. you know, like when there's someone who I can actually like talk about as a friend, yeah, like I'm very yeah. good friends with the euphonium player, Demandre Thurman. Mm hmm who's a pretty big name in the brass world. And so yeah, yeah. You know, he, he shares my stuff. And when I talk about him, it's like, he's my friend, like we're yeah. friends. And so it doesn't ever feel kind of like that smarmy kind of thing. Uh, it, it, you're totally right. Yeah. I think that that makes a really big difference. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I, but striking that balance is tricky. Twitter's a little bit different. Twitter is mostly is I put very little actually about music at all on Twitter. It's mostly just retweeting. I'm much more political on Twitter. I try I try to keep politics off of Facebook. Um, but if you ever go to like my Twitter feed, you will instantly either like me more or hate me because it's like there it's clear what the politics are. Um, yeah. And uh, it's a lot more like you know, it's it's not quite as PG thirteen as Facebook is. You know, uh, there's you know it's it's a bit, you know, more adult ish, I guess on Twitter. Um, but as a result, that makes the content about the music seem more out of place almost when I do want to post it. Um, I'm struggling now with like actually how to promote things as well as I used to be able to, because the algorithms on Facebook are making it more difficult as far as I can tell. Um, I used to be able to post like a link to a YouTube video of a new piece and it would get a lot of hits. Um, and now it gets far fewer because the algorithms no longer, if the Facebook, if the content wasn't created on Facebook, Facebook doesn't push it. Yeah. Um, and they, they're trying to force you to use their, their, their tools too, to pay. Exactly. Yeah. So I've not quite figured out that, how to get around that yet. You know, there are certain kinds of posts that will always show, but then, you know, whether it's a fan page or a personal page, certain things, it seems to like drop way down in how likely it doesn't push it unless you pay for it. Yeah. I think Facebook and social media is a powerful tool for band directors too, for their programs, but I don't think we have a good handle on how to use it yet necessarily, even 10 years in. Yeah. I mean, there's, there are things like that. There's that, that huge band directors group on Facebook, um, which seems like an amazing tool. I, they won't let me in. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, no, I know. I, I tried, and I actually got blocked. Like, not even just like, no, 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 you can't. No, it's, it's like it blocked me to the point that, it, as far as I can see, that group doesn't even exist anymore. It's like I've been ghosted by band. <laughs> 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 I'm a member of that group, but I was, I had the same experience. I, I could not get in until this year. I am now teaching. Uh, oh uh, yeah. I'm teaching fourth through eighth grade band this year. And they let me in because of that. Yeah. And I would do it. Yeah. So I, you actually have to be a band director. Yeah. I think that's fine. I think, you know, otherwise it becomes a ton of composers being like, Hey, I've got a new piece. Hey, I've got yeah. a new piece. And you don't want it to be that. John, one of the things that, you know, from my perspective as a composer, I don't write a lot of music. Um, I only write a couple pieces a year. And so I, I tend to put mine through the commercial publications. That's mm -hmm. where I go because that's comfort, comfortable for me. But you're a big champion of self-publishing. And I'm wondering if we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, of course. So I know that you recommend all composers self-publish. How do you manage it? Because you have, you have sell a lot of pieces. So I'm wondering, how do you manage your self-publishing? 
Yeah, so it initially was easy. Uh, when there was one piece, you know, that was that was pretty, pretty easy. Um, and I decided with the first piece that I would self-publish. Uh, so that was that Red Line Tango piece. And I started getting interest from existing publishers and including one that was like a you know big publisher that I had known, you know, growing up who published, you know, famous 20th century composers that I worshiped. Like I was like, oh my God, that publisher wants me. That would be amazing. But they only wanted the band version of Redline Tango. They didn't want the orchestra version. They didn't want my catalog. They didn't want me to be like one of their roster composers. They wanted the one piece, which to me said they want the one thing that's going to make money. And if that's the case, why don't I just do that? This is not that hard at this point, you know, with one piece. You know, even if it got a hundred performances that first year, I can do that. You know, that's that's totally doable by you know spending a lot of time at Kinkos or whatever and going to the post office every couple of days. And you know, that's do, that's doable and and worth it for the income difference, which is tremendous. It's between, you know, like the splits are either like 50-50 or for sales, it's often 90-10, which I used to live in LA and I remember talking to a film director at dinner one time and he was like, why don't you have a regular publisher? And I said, well, because the split is 90-10. He's like, well, yeah, that's what it is here in LA. That's what agents get. It's 10%. Like, oh, no, no, no. It's the other way around. The publisher gets 90%. The writer gets 10%. He's like, well, that's just stupid. No one should do that. And I think that it's – there are reasons to do it for sure. Like if you have a lot of other things going on, if, if, if the amount of time it takes is tremendous to do it yourself. Um, and if that's not your primary source of income and you just want to get, be able to get your name out there and have people promote it for you, you know, there are lots of valid, completely valid reasons to do that. Um, but in my case, it just, with one piece, it makes sense. And then I had two pieces and I could still do it. And then I had 10 pieces and I could, well, I probably before there were 10 pieces and it was starting to get difficult, especially once there became sales pieces too, because I was renting everything for a long time because it was very difficult stuff. So there wasn't getting a lot of performances. So you subsidize it by making a rental piece um, if only colleges are playing it. But once I had like high school pieces, those have to be sold. And um, then it became difficult to manage. Like, how do I do the printing? You know, I can't print, you know, a hundred sets at a time myself. That's just not possible. Um, so I found a printing company that did music and they, I ordered, uh, I remember I ordered 500 sets of undertow. And um, because the price difference was so much better per set at 500 than it was at 250. So I was like, oh, what the hell? So I ordered 500, but I didn't, do you know how big 500 copies of a piece is? <laughs> <laughs> so like, I'm like one day, I'm like, you know, sitting at the computer or probably honestly, I was probably playing video games and my phone rings and I hear this like loud truck noise, this engine noise. And this guy who's like, where's your loading dock? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I think you have a wrong number. He's like, no, I've got this pallet of paper. I think it's music or something. Where's your loading dock? I, oh my, oh no, what, what? So he pulls up, I lived in Austin, Texas at the time. So a semi truck pulls up in front of my house, like in basically the suburbs of Austin, Texas. And <laughs> it was a great big, like, you know, 18 wheel thing. And he's like, yeah, I've got your pallet. I'm like, great. It goes in the, uh, you know, in the garage. And he's like, all right, put it in the garage. And I'm like, me? I weigh like 110 pounds. I can't like move this like 1500 pound pallet. And uh, he was like, well, they didn't pay for, you know, pallet mover access. So you've got to just get this thing off the truck. And I'm like, I, and I thought I was going to, that's just, I can't do that. And uh, I was like, do you have a pallet mover? He said, yeah, I've got a pallet mover. And I said, well, I've got uh, 40 bucks. And he said, all right, then I've got a pallet mover for you. And so then he used his pallet mover and he like wheeled all this like 1500 pounds of music into the garage. And, uh, and that was insane, but that was one, <laughs> one sales piece. And then I just kept writing them. So, yeah. uh, eventually, uh, I had to switch to printers that would do smaller runs per piece, um, and higher staff. So I have two employees now, um, one who just does all the shipping and one who does all of the administrative stuff. And uh, so I don't do any of that anymore. It just became too time consuming and I wasn't writing music anymore. Um, yeah, you basically became your own publishing company in, in the end. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, with one client who's me, um, yeah, sure. 
But uh, yeah, so it, it's a it, once I figured out how to do it, it's pretty straightforward. But initially, it was complicated, and you know, uh, uh, and I, but I got to figure it out as I went. It's not like I had ten pieces to start. I had one, and then you know, I would add two or three pieces a year every year. And uh, I think I hired my first employee like four years ago, and then the second one two years ago or three years ago, and um, and that's been completely life changing to do that. Yeah. So where where would you send someone who asked for advice about self publishing? I know that your your website has some information. I know that Steve Bryant has some information on his website. Do you have any other uh, places where you'd send people? Not that I can think of. I mean, there now there are you know companies that essentially allow you to keep your copyright, but mm-hmm. they do all the work for you. Um, so that's, you know, a, a sort of a compromise if those, you know, percentages work for the particular composer. Um, and, uh, so, you know, those can be researched, you know, on your, I'm, my, I think on my website, I have two blog posts that are pretty long about publishing one about self-publishing music and then one also about just like audio which that one is basically obsolete now because there's no no one pays for audio anymore so you know there's not really anything to discuss there sadly thanks for tuning in today to listen to episode 100 with john mackey when i first started this project i wasn't sure i was going to make it five episodes or ten episodes or if anyone would listen and i certainly didn't think i'd have all of these amazing guests share their wisdom but that's exactly the right word the band community is amazing and i want to thank all of you for listening and for your support and for your encouragement over the past two years this has been a remarkable journey for me if you're finding value for from this podcast and you'd like to become a subscriber to the show, I do have a Patreon account. It's www.patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, backslash Mark J. Connor, C-O-N-N-O-R. And I only have one tier. It's a subscriber tier at $2 a month. That's less than, that's about 50 cents per episode. And so I plan to keep on delivering this content and for as long as I can or as long as I'm interested. And I want to thank all of you again for being part of the community and being part of the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now back to the interview with John Mackey. So John, you know, I'm going to kind of take us back a little bit and go back to the, you're starting on computer music and never playing an instrument. And so then when you went to Juilliard, you entered as a composition major, I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah. And you mentioned back that you were writing dance music or, or small dance chamber music or yeah, yeah, yeah. dance chamber music. And so you, your website is Osti music. It comes from ostinato. What sort of impact did writing for dance have on your style? Oh, that's a great question. No one ever, no, no one ever asked about that. Um, so, uh, I, I think because the stuff, a lot of the fast music I was writing was pretty derivative of like Bernstein and Shostakovich and, um, and as I wrote more and more through undergrad and then starting in grad school, um, I was, you know, rhythmically, the stuff was getting more and more mixed metered and stuff. Um, there was a class at Juilliard that was the best class I ever took through all of my education called Composers and Choreographers Workshop. And it, they took six composers and six student com- uh, choreographers, and they pair you up and then you make a five to six minute piece and you work on it all semester. And then in the in january they do these pieces with live music and you know live dance uh at el Sully hall at lincoln center and i did it the first time and i actually it was terrible uh because i was so writer blocked my first year at juilliard um mm, sure. so i got into cleveland city music for undergrad and that's a pretty small program and in cleveland and uh you know and i loved that and that was that felt really it felt small and homey almost and I'm from Ohio, so like that, that didn't feel like a foreign, scary thing. And uh, and then I got to Juilliard, and I remember being in my dorm room. I got there a day earlier than check-in was supposed to be. Um, they had allowed me to go early just because of how it worked with my family getting my stuff out there. And so I was basically the only one in the whole suite of rooms um, for that first night. And I remember like sitting in the the, the common space looking out the window of the Juilliard dorm. I was on the 23rd floor of this building in New York City where I had never been before. And I'm looking across the Hudson River and the sun is setting. And it's the most beautiful sunset because the pollution is pretty intense. <laughs> so like that, <laughs> that pollution makes for stunning sunsets in New Jersey. 
So I'm looking across the water and it's just beautiful. And I'm like, oh my God, Julia is downstairs. And I just started crying because I was like, I don't deserve to be here. I had this major imposter syndrome feeling like I am so not good enough to be here. Uh, I had managed to be invited to be a student at Coriano's without ever auditioning at Juilliard. So I had to go to audition day, but it was a technicality. I was already in his studio. So uh, I then I start having this, these doubts, like what if I had just auditioned the normal way? Like would I have made it past the original the initial screening? I, I, I could be terrible. I don't, what, what if I'm completely terrible? And I basically thought that way the whole first semester of school. And um, that was when I was writing this first dance piece. And so it was just awful what I did. I feel really bad for the choreographer. Uh, he did the best with what I gave him, but it was not good. Uh, the next year I started to get more comfortable. I repeated the class because you would repeat it for credit. And uh, it went much better. Uh, I also did like a, an, individual, an independent study piece for another, like a, a graduate senior dance student who choreographed like a 20 minute piece. I did that for that person. And then I graduated and was completely depressed and miserable because no one was asking for music. Like I thought, oh, now I'm, so then I got cocky. By the time, so I started Juilliard and I'm like, I am nobody, I'm a loser. By the time I finished, I was like, all right, clearly I made it through that. I must be awesome. The phone is going to ring off the hook now. And nobody calls. Like the first month after you finish your college, I think is the most depressing month of your life, unless you are immediately into a job. But if you are, a composer and there's not like a job job. It's just, it was awful. Um, so I was temping in New York city cause I could type really fast because all the computer stuff and I was miserable. And, um, I got a call in August from the teacher of that class, that composer choreographer workshop class. And she said, they didn't have enough composers signed up. Would I be willing to come back and audit just to like do them a favor and do it one more time, even though I'm not a student there anymore. And I was so excited that anybody would let me write anything again. So I said yes. And I made a, uh, I made arrangements with my work where I was temping to like let me off every Thursday afternoon. And I went to that class and I did the class that semester and I wrote Strange Humors for that class, which now is a band piece that still gets played a lot. Um, at the time, it was for string quartet and African hand drum djembe. And um, that I was just so excited to be writing. I wrote in a different style than I'd ever written before. And uh, part of it with writing for dance is it felt like, like if I were to string quartet, that's scary. You're like up against the Bartok quartets and the Beethoven quartets. And like, you know, you can't possibly compete with that. But if I'm writing for a string quartet, but I'm writing a ballet score, I'm writing a, not that there aren't amazing ballet scores, but the focus of a dance piece is the choreography. It's not the music for the most part. So I can like be wallpaper if I want to be, I can just be background. I can, even if I'm guiding what the movement is doing, if a critic goes to that, like if the New York Times goes to a dance performance, they will barely mention the music at all. It would be unusual if they give you an adjective about your music. Generally, it's just all about the choreography. So I could learn how to write music in a new way writing for dance and experiment with all this rhythmic stuff without it feeling like it was being judged as standalone abstract music. Um, and so that was what I was able to do for the like seven years after grad school until I finally started, figured out how to do band thing, which it was like seven years in between there. So you brought up something that we talked about in the beginning of our conversation that I don't think I was recording at the time. And you just brought it up again in that conversation a couple times, this idea of, of imposter syndrome among artists. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about that because I see this on that band directors group we talked about. I see people, band directors post, you know, I don't feel like I'm good enough for this. And, you know, you and I talked to like, as a composer, I wake up every morning and it's like, I got to fight that back. You know, it's like, you're okay. Just write today. You're okay. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, maybe give some advice for dealing with that. Oof. I think for me that caused a lot of like writer's block in the past where I would just be like, I don't have an idea. I'll never come up with an idea good enough. Um, I saw an interest. There's an interesting thing that my, my grad school teacher does in his apartment. So John Corleano is incredibly accomplished and in his studio, you, it's like a monument to his accomplishments. It mm -hmm. was, it's sort of, it's an interesting thing. He's got this huge poster from the Metropolitan Opera, from the opera that he met, that he wrote for them in the 80s, goes to Versailles. He's got 
you know, his, his Academy Award. He's got Grammys. He's got like the Pulitzer in the bathroom on like stuck on this, like this hook finger above the toilet. He likes <laughs> like the telegram that came, he like sticks it, he stuck it on above the toilet. Um, but it's like letters from Bernstein and like, it's just amazing. And I thought, you know, part of it was like, Whoa, that is, that dude is just like throwing down being like, look what I can do. You know, you go to, you go to lessons and that doesn't make you feel like you're good when you go to the lesson, that room and you're like, geez, what the hell? But he, the reason he says he does it is to remind himself that he has done it and can do it again. Um, and That's I think, yeah. And, and I think it really is. He really is, uh, he has a very hard time writing and still feels like he's not very good, um, which is crazy to me, but not to him. You know, that's really generally what he feels, but he can look up and be like, okay, well, at least I know I have been able to do it multiple times. So maybe I can do it one more time. And for me, like the way I eventually got over writer's block stuff is I figured out to stop letting myself just be freaked out about being stuck and know that I've, gotten unstuck so many times now i will eventually figure it out if i have enough time uh and sometimes you really just don't have enough time and i know those pieces i know those pieces of mine where i'm like ooh, if i'd had two more weeks this piece would have been so much better yeah, um, but, yeah. but in but if i have plenty of time then i always feel like i can find the best solution i know how to find um and it may not, that doesn't mean the piece is going to be some masterpiece, but it means at least I, it's the best I could make it if I've just given time to do it. Um, and so I think, you know, having a track record for myself is, is reassuring, but it's still, every time I start a piece, it still feels that way. It still feels like, oh, is this going to be any good? Like I just finished a big 20 plus minute piece that's premiering at uh, CBNA, the national thing in uh, the convention in Tempe, Arizona at the end of February. And it's, it's pretty high profile because it's about my mother who has dementia and a lot of people are in on the consortium on it and they'll be at this concert. And a lot is built up about, you know, there hasn't been a band piece that explores this and the scale before. So that feels like a ton of pressure. It's also about my mother, um, which is hard. And so the whole time writing, it just felt like I, suck like i can't possibly come up with anything that's worthy of what all of this is and i don't know if i did honestly but it's done so at least it's done and uh but that's scary to know what that will be like to be in the room when that premieres because that's like also a very like honest piece where i'm not writing to convey emotion i'm writing the emotion i'm feeling while i'm writing it um and that's a different scarier more exposed thing to do so that's scary for all kinds of reasons. Yeah, I find I I don't like my premieres of things. I'm really <laughs> self conscious. <laughs> no, me too. Me too. And you know, they I usually know at the dress rehearsal. Okay, this is going to go great, and the piece is good or bad, or this is not going to go the way it's supposed to go. Uh, I hope it gets a second performance that will go better. Um, and because it's just out of your hands, you. You know, you you hope that everybody is on the same page, literally, you know, like, and you know, <laughs> starts and ends together, and it's basically the piece that you imagined. But you know, once they start playing, someone screws up or whatever. The audience doesn't know whether it was the player or what I wrote on the page. Um, and uh, you know, I've had both kinds of premieres. So they they don't get any easier. I don't like I don't like being there either. Um, you know, I have pieces I like hearing live of mine and some that I really don't want to hear live because so much can go wrong versus like asphalt cocktails fun to hear live because it never goes badly. It's what uh, I once heard uh, Bob Reynolds describe the music of Frank to Kelly as being a styrofoam boat, but it takes a lot of bullets before that thing goes down. Like I think asphalt cocktail is, is a styrofoam boat. Before we get into my final questions, and I know that you didn't want a list of questions, but I have a group that I ask all of my guests. Mm, okay. I just want to ask one more question about your style, because I know my listeners who who, who love your music or play your music a lot, they're, they're interested in hearing that. Do you have a, sort of a, a process for writing your style, or do you have, I don't know, I don't know if I'm writing asking this the right way, but do you have a general thought about how you go about conceiving and writing a piece of music? Uh, no. Um, and I hope that it, 
I hope that each piece sounds different than my other pieces, but it's still identifiable by having the same DNA in it. Um, like I feel like I write in all kinds of different styles, but I hope that they all still are recognizable as coming from me. Um, there, that piece I mentioned that I just finished that's about my mother, I think the first third of that actually doesn't really sound that much like me because I was trying to do a new thing, um, which is always scary when you do a new thing. You know, it can either be, you get a lot of things from people who do programming that are like, oh, you should try a new thing. And then you try a new thing. And half the time they're like, yeah, no, not that. <laughs> We're not playing that one. Go back to the other thing. We don't really mean it when we say try a new thing. Um, so, you know, that's, that's like a, a risky, scary thing to have done. And I don't know if it worked. Um, but as far as like what my style is, I don't, I think I found a sound when I was like 24 um, that I can't not do. Um, there's just a certain way that I voice chords, a certain way that I, you know, stack the trombones and the way I approach percussion. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hear sometimes from young composers that you can tell they mostly listen to band music and have heard a bunch of my music that there are elements that they like pull where I'm like, Oh, look, they've exactly voiced the brass the same way I voiced the brass. Um, which is cool, but then also makes me feel like, Ooh, do I need to stop doing that? Like, is it becoming such a sound that other composers who are in an earlier generation are going to take, make better than I know how to do. And then I will just be like left behind. So this is like, you talk about the imposter syndrome. I still have that that way too. I still feel like I'm going to be replaced at any time by someone much, much better than I am. And I will be seen as a fraud. So I have to keep developing in some way so that I don't just keep writing the same piece over and over again. I'm trying to find new sounds that might stick and become part of my style in the future. Um, but you just don't know where that's going to go. So let's give the listeners a vicarious thing here. So what was it like to write for Joe Alessi and Chris Martin? <laughs> Uh, I, uh, so the Alessi thing was especially crazy because, you know, literally the greatest trombonist who has ever walked the planet. And so he, you can write anything for him, but the problem is you can write anything for him. So the challenge there was to find, you know, what did he want to play? Um, and in talking to him before I started the piece, it was clear that he wanted to play lyrically, um, and that he felt like some of the concertos he had gotten previous previously were not so much concertos as they were demos, you know, like here's here, the trombone can do this and the trombone can do this and the trombone, you know, and so I had to work really hard not to allow that to happen um, because it could very easily. So I just needed to have a clear idea of what, you know, the story literally, because it's a programmatic piece, what the story was going to be before I started writing it and then try to stick to that and think of him like the lead uh, in an opera telling that story where he's Pavarotti on stage at the Met singing this story and, but without words, he's instead playing it through a trombone. So that was how I conceptualized the piece. So that worked well for him. And that was, you know, with him, that's a case very much of like you, like I said, I talked earlier about worrying about premieres. There was no worry about that premiere. There was nothing could go wrong because it was uh, the first one that I heard at least was him and the uh, West Point band. So professional players and him. And it, I knew that was going to be good. And it was spectacular from like that first performance, just astonishing. Um, and, you know, better than I imagined it. Um, you know, usually like, oh, that was almost as good as I imagined. No, this was so much better than I thought I had done um, because he's just such an incredible artist on that instrument. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, similar experience for the trumpet concerto, uh, that one, I didn't know when uh, Chris Martin was going to play that one while I was writing it, initially while I started it. Um, so for that, I uh, wrote, it, it's, it's ridiculously difficult, but goes through a lot of different trumpets. That's the fault of Jens Lindemann, who teaches at UCLA. Um, when I decided to write a trumpet concerto, I saw him at a reception after a concert and we've both been drinking, probably. And we, he's like, here's what makes a trumpet concerto good. Lots of trumpets. Oh, jeez. <laughs> like, yeah. And he's like, no, the more, the more that the, the audience sees on the floor for them for you have to pick up, the more they like that piece before it even starts. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so I did that, but that was perhaps foolish, it turns out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now I know. <laughs> um, 
But uh, yeah, it was it was amazing to work with Chris on that piece, and uh, and he recorded it with the Dallas Winds, and uh, that should be coming out fairly soon. All right, John, let's get into these final questions here. This has been great so yeah. far. I really appreciate yeah. this. I don't think there's been anything that we really need to take out. I'm a little concerned no, about so my far. opening with the uh, <laughs> bringing up the, that blog article. I kind of hit the most controversial thing right off the bat, but <laughs> no, I think I, you know, it's still up there. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, it, it was like, it's weird that it's been used like in classes and things it's been printed and distributed and it's, we're just a different time now than it was 15 years ago. I like to think I would, I mean, I know I would not write that now. Um, I think I'm, I, you know, we, uh, people do dumb stuff that's that the times just are not the same and good for good reason. Like, you know, anyway. <laughs> so John, competition in music is something that happens in many different ways. Where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? Oh, oh. uh, like with, for myself personally, just in, in, it could be for you. It could be in general. Any, any, I mean, I am, I am, definitely competitive with other composers for sure even my friends um and to me i think that's healthy you know i'm not you know going to sabotage anybody or anything obviously i want everybody to be successful what happens for me primarily is to if one of my composer colleagues is particularly successful i to me that makes me want to raise my own bar to just feel like I can keep up at least with everybody. Um, so it, 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 it keeps me from getting lazy. Um, it's, uh, I think that's the main thing for me. To me, it's a healthy, good thing. Although I certainly do get, you know, like all of us get jealous and envious and have ugly feelings like that. Um, but, uh, for the most part, if it doesn't reach that, I think it's a good thing. Mm, yeah. Use kind of a motivational. Exactly. Yeah. All right, John, this is a, a question. And band directors especially struggle with this. Uh, there's a running joke among band directors that they're always the last car out of the parking lot. And that's how do how do you as a as a composer, but how do musicians in general, how should we achieve a work life balance? Ugh, geez, don't ask me that. Oh man. Um yeah, no, it's you know, if I'm really working, that's all I'm doing. Um, you know, I'm terrible in conversation. Um, I think I have a little ADD, which makes it so that, uh, once I'm focused on the piece, it is really hard for my brain to turn that off at any point in the day to then have a normal conversation. I will be looking at you, looking in your eyes while you're talking and nodding. And I have no idea what you're saying. I'm just like listening to the piece in my head and revising it. Um, I am not good with like a work life balance but then once the piece is done then i i'm also i'm very difficult to be around i think while i'm writing because if it's going badly i'm super depressed and cranky um but once it's done or i have a good day then it's like i'm you know just on way too much coffee or something and i just you know am super it's it's a very you know back and forth intensely emotionally back and forth then while i'm working and it you know, I apologize for those who ever have to experience that. Um, but you know, I, I don't work so much of the year that it's like, I'm like it all the time. I take a lot of time between pieces to just reset. So I think for me, a big thing that makes it better is that, you know, I might go two months without writing the music so that when I come back, I'm fresh and, you know, and in the meantime, I have like, you know, rebuilt relationships with human beings before I get back into finale again. From your perspective, where you sit in the band community, what are the challenges facing music and or music education as we move forward into the 21st century? Oh, um, yeah, I feel like I'm not a good person to ask that question. Um, only because I, well, partially because I'm not an educator. Um, and also I get a very skewed view of what's happening. I think um, I work with, I'm really fortunate to work with groups that are privileged groups, like not because they work with me, but because if they're bringing me in, they have means. Um, so that means I'm only really seeing programs that have access to funds to fly someone in or, you know, commission a piece or, you know, I'm not, 
you know, and that is by far the minority of ensembles. Um, you know, I'm not working with groups where, you know, they, they have 14 people in band this year and they have to figure out what they're going to play. Um, you know, I, or it could just, it, I, I wish I could, I don't know. I, I don't really, I, I just don't know how to answer that one. That was really tough for me. All right, John. So this is my favorite question of the whole thing. And this is if you could turn back the clock and you could talk to yourself at your high school graduation, give yourself some advice, what would you say? Um, uh, uh, well, honestly, I would, I would say, don't be a jerk. Um, like I was, you know, I talked about being at Juilliard and having this imposter syndrome, but once I got over that, I think I was really unpleasant. Um, I think I was mean in rehearsals. I think I was suspicious of the success of other people. I was jealous to the point of being unhealthy and unhealthy and making me unhappy. Um, and, you know, I just, I wish I hadn't been like that. And I had, after enough rehearsals with good friends of mine in groups where I would have a rehearsal with the chamber ensemble, and they would take me aside and say, you know, you will get much better results out of us if you're not like that. You know, we all are, we're all here at Juilliard. We're really good. You know, uh, there's a reason we're all here and you are treating some of us like we're not good at our job, really. And that's insulting and it makes us upset and play even worse. So that's not how you need to do this. Um, and eventually that stuck and I started to be more pleasant just in general. Um, and uh, I just wish I'd figured it out sooner. I would have had more friends who were closer friends in grad school, I think, in particular, if I had just figured that out sooner. I don't know if I was overcompensating because of getting there and feeling like I didn't deserve to be there, that I was trying so hard to convince myself I was something special and did deserve to be there, that you know I overdid it and acted like I was better somehow. Um, and, uh, you know, it was short lived, but I regret it. All right. So John, I'm going to ask you two, two parts of this question. And I ask all my composers, if someone were to, to just come to your music for the first time, they didn't know anything about John Mackey, what work would you point them to, to listen to of yours? Ooh. Uh, boy, it goes back and forth between wine, dark sea and the frozen cathedral. I think maybe wine, dark sea, because it's, uh, bigger piece and explores, I had really wanted to do a really large structure piece where I could explore in a non-rushed way, different sound worlds. And, um, and I think that piece does that. And I'm really proud of that piece that took you know, nine months to write that thing and was a brutal experience, but it turned out as best as I knew how to write it. So I think that one. Yeah. Is Frozen Cathedral your most popular piece? No, no, it's really, really hard. Uh, and it requires a harp and 10 percussionists and celeste. It gets played a lot. Um, I think of the rental catalog, Aurora Awakes is the most popular. Oh, okay. And of, and of the sales pieces, the best seller of all time of mine is Foundry um, because it's a grade three. And, and I hit on like a lightning and a bottle kind of an idea there to use sound percussion. Um, and I think other than that, maybe Sheltering Sky still gets played a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. They're all good pieces. Yeah. I was going to say Ooh. Foundry probably gets the, yeah. I mean, I see that listed on a lot of programs. Yeah. If you could choose, what would be the last work you would listen to or engage with? Ooh, of any piece, any, any, of, like, of any medium? Any piece, any medium. It could be banned. It could be anything. Oh, it's, yeah, wow. it's hard. It's hard to answer. Oh, Oh man. Um, I think the one that comes to mind is maybe it would be Ravel something. It would either be the left hand piano concerto or, or Daphis and Chloe, but, uh, probably the left hand piano concerto. That's so hard. Cause I'd almost want to say John Adams harmony Lara, but I hate the middle movement. So I think, I think I'll go with, I think I'll go with the left hand piano concerto Ravel. Oh, yeah. cool. No one said that. You know, Robert Sheldon, <laughs> I just interviewed Robert Sheldon and he said Daphnis at Chloe. Oh, good. So, good taste. yeah, <laughs> it's a great piece. I get a lot of Mahler for that answer. 
Oh, well, band people. You know, you're talking to band people. Yeah. <laughs> I like the brass. Does anyone say Bruckner? I think I've had one Bruckner. And I get a lot of band pieces, too, of course. I mean, I guess if the question is, like, what's the last piece that you – all right, we're going to put this on, and then you're going to die. Like, I would probably pick Bruckner or something because it would feel like a long time. But like, <laughs> 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 What's two hours? What's the right? – what's the uh, what was the piece that goes on for oh, 700 God. years? <laughs> what's, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, shoot. I'm blanking. Yeah, there's a – well, and also I think Cage has a piece for organ that's supposed to last, like, a thousand years or something. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll so, take that one. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned a little bit about the, this piece that I wrote about my mother who's been suffering from dementia, and I wrote a 24-minute piece for Soprano and Large Wind Ensemble that uh, Arizona State is premiering with Gary Hill conducting at CBDNA at the end of February um, in Tempe at that convention. I'm really, really excited about that. Uh, I mean, I'm excited. I, I think it might be an okay piece. Uh, so maybe ask me again, like at, after the dress rehearsal, but I, I'm, I, I'm excited to hear the result of that thing finally happening. Um, and, uh, so that's what I spent most of 2018 writing. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's about to premiere. And then I just now I'm still working on, um, I'm making an easier version of the first movement of wine, dark sea, I've done the other movements as you know, kind of slightly stripped down versions. Um, there's a piece called Lightning Field that is sort of the last movement of Wine Dark Sea adapted. Um, a piece called This Cruel Moon, that's the middle movement. And now I'm doing the first movement, which was called Hubris. It's a big march. Um, and I don't know what the title will be of the finished one, but that will be the next thing. And that's like, so that's two pieces. One that's basically you know not approachable because it's a soprano and it's a grade six at a 25 minutes long but then the other thing is like a five minute march <laughs> how can people get in touch with you john um i finally after years of negotiating now own john mackey.com so they can go to john mackey.com and then there's a contact button on there um that actually goes to my staff but i see it so uh, I can chime in and, you know, respond is this or whatever. A, and I'm on. I'm, oh, sorry, I was going to say, is this different than Osti music or has that been all imported over? It's mirrored. So um, if, if you see, it's exactly the same site. It's just actually, it's redirecting everything. So it's ostimusic.com. It's just easier to remember now. Yep, John I see it. I see it. Excellent. And uh, yeah. So, and, uh, and also I'm not, you know, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and that stuff. John, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This was super fun. I enjoyed this a lot. 